Afrik Mon Afrik. Thank you for watching the Dachi Kanya video podcast. This is the Dachi Kanya video podcast. My guest today is Madam Josine Nkroma. In Africa today, when people think about leadership, they mostly think of politics and dictatorship. Meanwhile, many Africans are conquering other sectors in spite of their meager resources. Dachi Kania shares the experiences of these African leaders with you to help build the leadership skills of upcoming African leaders, both at home and abroad. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to have the young ones around us. All right, so I'm fired up for the show today, and I hope you're also fired up. I have been looking forward to it, so let's go. Let's start by talking about your family. So who is Madame Justin Nkroma? Okay, so everybody called me when I was growing up Nana because my, my, my native name is Nanefuesh Mama. But when I went into secondary school, it quickly changed to Josie, because I'm Josephine, so the short form. And so over the years, I've come to be known as Josie, even at home. So growing up, my nucleus family come from a family of, um, let's say, six. I have three other siblings. I have a sister, two brothers and of course my, my parents came from a very strict background. My father is a retired naval captain. My mother, who passed on some 16 years ago, was um, a devoted housewife, uh, even though she did her own little trading on the side. And so I come from a humble background, um, but my parents nurtured certain values with me, and I think these values have been the cornerstone of my life ever since. Discipline, honesty, integrity, hard work, and humility. So I quickly learned at home that um, leadership came with responsibility, and it wasn't a matter of your position as being the first, and so you lorded it over anybody. On the contrary, you expected to guide and take care and lead by example. So that's the kind of background I came from. And of course, I've always, I've, I grew up in Ghana. All my schooling was in Ghana. I went to Association International School as a young child and moved on to Fansman Girls Secondary School then, and then went on to the University of Ghana and then the Ghana School of Law, and then finally finished off at the um, IMO International Maritime Law Institute where I studied maritime law for my master's in law. So that pretty much is my background. So what are some of your hobbies? Mm. My hobbies, talking, <laughs> cooking. I love everything about food. So from cooking to learning new recipes, I like to explore new, new cooking methods all the time. And of course, eating food. I always, when people talk about food, I don't like to go out with friends who are always on a diet, no. Because I always say to them, what's the point of it? Our best moment is always accompanied by food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I believe strongly that food has a very dominant role in our lives, even though some of us underrate what food can do. So how would you describe Ghana to a foreign friend from a touristic standpoint? Wow. Okay. So, growing up, I think I probably had a bit of an idyllic um, perception of what Ghana was. Um, I was fortunate to have um, my, grand my grandmother living in the village in Apam. So, for me, growing up was like, okay, you come to the city and there's a city life. But there was also the village life that was peaceful, where you got to enjoy nature and intermingle with you know, your relatives back home. So growing up, that is the little I knew. I knew Takrade, I knew the Takrade Harbor, and then you went to the Akos, um, Akosombo Dam, and those were the exciting things we did. But um, I also wanted to see a lot more. I, I love to travel as well, so I 
on my own, I would take trips to certain parts of Ghana, you know, to certain parts of Ghana. I believed I wanted to see a lot more of Ghana. So um, it wasn't, then it wasn't as exciting as it is now because you didn't really have that many hotels and you still don't have them. But it gave you the opportunity to see Ghana. And I always associated traveling outside Accra as getting at one with nature. So I, I always saw nature as one of our, 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 our great points as, um, as, a, as, as a country where we had beautiful nature that people could explore from the hills of Afajato, the mountains of Afajato to the beautiful beaches along the coast. We had the castles to see and all of that was truly amazing to me and so I thought Ghana was really a beautiful country and they were, um, joining public service and in the job that I currently do as the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education it's been a privilege for me because it's given you you know access to every part of the country so I think there's so much in Ghana to see and in every region there is something that expresses what makes us Ghanaian and what makes us unique and what makes it almost irresistible to come and see Ghana. Okay, so on that note, what other country do you, African country do you admire most aside Ghana? I think I admire Ethiopia. Ethiopia? Yeah. Why? I admire Ethiopia because, as they would probably tell you, they are the only African country that was not colonized. Okay. So they'll tell you that with pride. But there is something about Ethiopians that I wish we could imbibe in Ghana. There is a certain fierce sense of pride of being Ethiopian, of eating Ethiopian, dressing Ethiopian, doing everything Ethiopian. So you find that even though I have not been to Ethiopia, I have I have listened to my friends who've lived there, I've read about it, I've had the opportunity to fly some of their aircraft, to, you know, to travel in their aircraft, and they are such a proud African country to exhibit what is Ethiopian, and they do so with pride. You know, it's, it's, so, it's almost etched in their DNA, and that is what I admire and I'd like to see in Ghana. It's not a perfect country, but which country is anyway. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from them as Ghanaians. But um, in, in Ethiopia, there is a certain heritage they treasure, that they, they, they preserve, and that they ensure that it's passed on from generation to generation. Awesome. <laughs> so how would you personally define leadership? Hmm. So my idea of leadership is predicated on my childhood. As I said, growing up, the fact that you were the older one meant more responsibility. It also meant service. So I see leadership really as service. I don't see leadership as a, a title so to speak, that everybody must, you know, kotow to you. But I believe very much that leadership is all about service. That is how I see leadership. So can you name an African leader who has had an impact on you as a leader? Hmm. An African leader who has had an impact on me, I, I, are you talking about political leadership? Any. Okay, so... I really would start from my parents. Okay. They were the leaders of the home. Yeah. Okay, so I had that strong upbringing from my parents. And as I said earlier on, that is what guided me. But growing up, perhaps I have a certain penchant for um, what is in chroma because I'm in chroma and I'm, I'm, there's actually um, a connection. Yeah. Yes. So um, we grew up. Um, with more history, and we, we truly idolized Nkrumah. I find him as one of the few visionary leaders of our time, and 
like you know when like everyone else he wasn't perfect but he had a lot to offer Ghana and um, many of the things we see today are still a testament for his visionary leadership so I believe very strongly that um, a kind of leader who was all about rallying not just Ghana but the larger African continent a lot has to be said for his his leadership rule and actually galvanizing other leaders in Africa to begin to um, agitate for independence and during that time we actually did see a lot of independence um, following Ghana's independence and it is not for nothing that he, he saw us as the black star of Africa and the shining light and I think in deep down you st we still have that in us as Ghanaians we want to um, take the lead in certain things and um, I mean look at what we are going through in COVID today and we are one of the few African countries who have been commended for you know the, the strong leadership that we've had in fighting or containing and combating the coronavirus. And I think um, it goes to show that there is indeed something in Ghana that makes us a special people. And I'm proud to be Ghanaian. So what makes an African leader stand out in the crowd of mediocrity? I think a lot of what we call African leaders has been seen negatively. You have globally, when we talk about African leaders, a lot of people think about corruption, they think about dictatorship, they think about um, old men in the, in, you know, running the affairs of a country for their own personal interest. But I don't think it is representative of leadership in Africa. And by leadership, is, I'm not necessarily referring to leadership where people are elected or appointed. There is a leader in each one of us. And in every corner that you work or that you thrive as a human being, there is something in you that makes you stand out as an individual. And so there, there are innate people who are born with the innate qualities of leadership. They are those that is thrust upon and of course they are those that are elected and all of that. But I strongly believe that when we talk of African leadership today, we are talking of a leader who is visionary. We're talking of a leader who has a sense of an innovative approach to solving Africa's problems the African way. I think that as Africans for too long we, we kind of inherited or it was thrust upon us a certain system, system of government, a certain system of governance and of doing things. So Africa as a continent, if you go back in history with all the scramble and partition for Africa, we have been compelled to build artificial borders. And that has largely driven the wars and ethnic ethnicity and you know chieftaincy was all over Africa and that has been a setback in Africa's progress but I believe strongly that the African leader today must be the one that can inspire inspire Africans everywhere to begin to want to do things for themselves the African way and I think for, for today's leader, he must be somebody who can al allow the African mind to grow. And so the biggest, the biggest investment any leader will do today is to invest in the human capital. I'd also like to see an African leader that allows the African woman to grow. Yes. Okay, so what is the biggest challenges facing African leaders today? Hmm. I think the biggest challenge facing African leaders, some would say it is infrastructure, it is corruption. But I think the biggest challenge facing African leaders today is the psyche of the people. Okay. I believe strongly that a strong a strong-minded citizen can do anything they put their minds to. 
And so I don't believe that these challenges do not exist. They exist. But I also think it's because largely we have forgotten to groom and grow our minds as a people, as African people, with a can-do spirit, with the ability to think for ourselves and do things for ourselves. And I think any country that begins to invest heavily in the mindset of the people is a country that will grow, that will progress, and that will thrive. So I, I personally think our biggest challenge is changing the mindset of the African, for the African to believe that there's a lot more they can do, a lot more that is within us that is untapped, and which we must begin to take advantage of. So what has been your defining moment, the aha moment that caused you to realize you could actually lead others? That's a difficult question because um, leadership more or less was always thrust on me. I, 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 never, I never actually went out looking to lead. So I started from home. So you had all this one, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to make sure this is done. And somehow it carried into school. So I think I carried with me a, a certain sense of responsibility that some teachers saw. And I had teachers that um, unwittingly also nurtured leadership qualities in me. So from class one right through to class seven, I was al almost always a class prefect. You understand me? So I kind of grew into, into that role. And then in sixth form, I, I was the compound prefect. And so at any given point in time, people thought I could lead. And I took on the mantle of leadership with an attitude of service, with an attitude of there's a job to be done, we need to get it done, and I'm going to get it done with the people around me. So that is how it, it's always been. And um, through uni and then into law school, I was not in any leadership role for that matter. Um, but after, after law school, started work as a young lawyer. I don't think I, I nurtured any ambitions at all of, of, of leadership. It's, it's, it's not been something that I, I go looking for. It, it's more or less come to me. And today I sit in the position I hold because I did not go looking for it. You understand me? So I think it's um, every day you find yourself taking on a bigger rule and the important thing for you to do at that point is to ask yourself what value you bring to the table and what difference you can make yes so what has been your worst leadership moment that caused you to almost give up on your leadership aspiration and how did you recover from that like i said i've not really had leadership aspirations i want to lead here or i want to lead here but Whatever role I've been given, I've taken it very seriously. Okay. So what habits have you included in your daily routine as a leader? I think the first habit is prayer. Okay. Having your time to meditate, to commune with God, gives you a sense of peace. It gives you a sense of calm to face your day. So your morning of prayer a time alone with God. It doesn't have to be any extended period of time. But so far as you think that you have communed with God, you've committed your day into his hands and into his care, I think it is one of the key things that drives my day. I must start with a word of prayer. I must start with a word, with a, a time of meditation. So that for me is one of the best habits. Another thing is to have a... Um, to have an inquiring mind. Um, you don't know it all. In fact, the more you, you get to know, the, the more you know, you, you know less. Mm -hmm. You understand? So um, having a mindset that is ready to read widely, not just around your sphere of work. 
All right. So what's your vision for Africa? Well, my vision for Africa has, has always been very optimistic. Optimistic because I see the vast natural resources that our country, our, the different countries of Africa have. And I believe that we're getting to the point where the youth are becoming more and more influential in what affects governance in our respective countries. So for Africa, I see us tapping more into the natural resources that we have. And I see a future that is bright because um, if you look around the different continents, I think Africa has the vast, the, the vast resources that anybody anywhere in the world will want to tap into. Say um, you, Africa is made a country mm -hmm. and you are made the president of uh, Africa, what's going to be the first policy you would implement as the president? Hmm. <laughs> there are a number of... <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, the number of things that I've, I've alluded to earlier, but I think the first thing is having a clear policy on how we develop our mindset. Mm -hmm. That, for me, is critical to the success of Africa. So, for me, arriving at a policy that allows us to implement um, programs and strategies that allow the African child to grow. The belief in the African and the self-confidence of the African standing at par with any other continent. That for me is. If you get a chance. Maybe it's idealistic. Okay. <laughs> if you get the chance to travel back to your younger self, what are going to be some of the things you encourage your younger self to do and to also change? Okay, so I think one of the first things that I would do is to, I, I'm an avid reader, but I never really, in, as a young person, I never really read um, books that inspired, or, you know, read about inspiring leaders. I, most of what I read were novels. I did a lot of, I read a lot of novels. So growing up, I then, I then learned to diversify. But I think one of the things as going, looking back, I perhaps should have been more intentional about my future. I always knew that I wanted to be a lawyer, and so everything was about working towards being a lawyer. So I go to school, I wasn't too interested in what was going on around me, except that, okay, you want to be a lawyer, what do you do? You learn, you study, you pass, you go to the bar, this, the bar you're called to the bar, and then you're a lawyer. So going back, I would be more intent. I would have been more intentional about my goals and um, my aspirations. And um, I, I, I did then. That is one of the things that I look back on. And so it is something that I try and imbibe in young people very quickly to visualize who they want to be and how they intend to achieve it. Okay. So we are almost done with our conversation. But then before you go would like you to advise the youth out there who are also aspiring to become leaders. Okay, so first thing you must believe in yourself. It's very important. You must believe that what you set out to do, you can do. You must believe that you have a higher purpose and a higher calling for being here. And you should not let it go to waste. So you must have some moments of introspection where you actually spend time in determining who it is that you are, who you want to be, and how you're going to achieve it. Okay. But our last question for the day, um, what is your best quote, something that inspires you whenever you tend to say it? Wow. My first best quote is a biblical one. It says, be still and know that I am God. So in the busyness and the anxieties of life, I'm always mindful of when I think I'm getting anxious. I remember that. I said, no, there's, there's someone who is, who is um, 
leading my path and, and, and watching me. And so I shouldn't be in a hurry to probably take things, try and do things my way. And then I think my other quote has always been around the role of leadership. And it has to do with, um, I've, I've forgotten how it, it really goes, but it's about service and leadership. So it's not about, it's not about the, the title. It's really about the goal. And once you have in mind that you have a goal to make a difference, that is what determines a good leader from a bad one. Thank you very much Thank for you. being on the show with us today. We really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Time. Thank you. We wish you all the best in your endeavors. I've learned to pray and read wide. I don't know what you have learned today, but leave a comment about what you have learned today. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. My name is Gracia Ajaman. See you same time next week. Thank you for watching today's episode of Dashi Kania. I hope you have been inspired. Please follow us on our various social media platforms and please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.